This all started a few weeks ago. I will give a little background first. I met my girlfriend just after college and we have been together for a little over seven years. We currently live in a two bedroom cottage in our hometown. It is a very rural area where we live and it takes around an hour to get into the city. We both work in the city, but I work a couple of days a week from home. The company my girlfriend works for is a non-profit, charitable organization. She works in the social media department and their main ethos is to encourage positive change. The videos they promote are usually quite uplifting stories. They share a lot of them, but also create their own. This means that they will occasionally appear in the videos if they are interviewing someone or acting something out, so to speak. A few weeks ago, she told me to check out one of the videos where she had interviewed someone. I watched the video and then decided to read some of the comments. I'm not a very jealous person, but I kind of wanted to know what people were saying, specifically about her. The comments were pretty mundane at first, the usual fight the power type responses. I became a bit obsessed and kept scrolling through. There was the occasional misogynist comment, but nothing I did not expect. That was until I found a few comments that unsettled me. The original comment had around 10 likes and had tagged a number of other accounts. The message said, We cannot wait for you to join us. You are perfect. I clicked on the replies and the accounts that had been tagged had all replied. The messages ranged from stating that she was the perfect match for their group to openly discussing what type of underwear they thought she was wearing. Wow, this was discussed in quite some detail. I figured it was just a bunch of desperate guys until I read another reply. It said how he had watched her eating her lunch in the park yesterday. He wanted to go up to her and introduce himself but knew that was not part of the rules. He described in detail what she was wearing. It was exactly what she wore yesterday. This was highly concerning to me and I contacted my girlfriend to tell her about this and advised her to delete the comments and contact the administrators of the site. I looked through previous videos and saw that these comments were frequent on videos that she appeared in. They were always the same and always mentioned her joining them and how she was exactly what they wanted. They were all throwaway accounts with the only friends being the people that were tagged in the comments as well. The accounts were reported to the site admins and we heard nothing more about it for a couple of weeks. That was until late last week. I received a phone call from my girlfriend when I was working from home. Well, that was unexpected, she said, but how did you get them to agree to putting that? Sorry, I'm not sure what you mean. Is everything okay? I said confused. The flowers, silly, I love them. The note was a little bit naughty though. What if my colleague saw that? She said, chuckling down the phone. What do you mean? I said. I didn't send you any flowers. What? She said. Then who did? What did the note say? Maybe they're from your mom. No, she paused, then continued. The note said, roses are red, violets are blue. I am using my hand, but thinking of you. What the hell? Call the police? That is a concern. I said, standing up, almost throwing my phone across the room. She sounded really shaken up and abruptly ended the call telling me she was going to contact the police right away. I drove up to her office later that evening to pick her up, rather than her taking the train. I was terrified at the thought of someone following her once she left the office. The police took the letter in as evidence. They also looked through the comments to see if they could trace the comments back to the people behind the accounts. The flowers had not been sent through a company or a courier service, which means that one of these men must have hand-delivered them to the front desk where she works. We were both shaken up on the way home and barely spoke about the incident. Her boss told her to work from home for the rest of the week until everything calmed down. We did not hear anything after that for a few days and her boss told us that nothing else had arrived at the office. We went to see family this weekend to try and take our minds off of things. We arrived back home a few hours ago and something immediately felt off. The house itself seemed untouched, but the back garden gate was left wide open. 
I entered the house cautiously and searched the whole house, but found nothing. I went to the back of the cottage and noticed some marks on the back window, though. It looked as if someone had been clasping their hands together to look inside. We debated calling the police, but was tired and couldn't prove anything. We also live quite far away from the nearest police station, so it would have taken them a while to get there had we called them anyways. We decided to close all the curtains and make sure the place was locked up and headed to bed. I kept the phone next to me on speed dial just in case and I had my trusty baseball bat at the side of my bed as well. I couldn't sleep much, so I decided to head into the living room and watch some television. I was about to call it a night when I heard some commotion coming from the front of the cottage. I hesitantly walked over to the window and pulled back the curtain slightly. It was dark, but I could make out a number of hooded figures standing around 15 feet away from the house. They were swaying in sync with each other and chanting something that I couldn't hear. I opened the curtains a little more to get a better look at them, and as I did, the figure stopped chanting and stared directly at me. In the brief moment that I looked over at them, I saw their faces. They were men, but their faces were void of any emotion at all. They were completely blank as they stared at me, as if staring right through me. I quickly pulled the curtains back in pure terror and stumbled across the hallway back into the bedroom. I grabbed the phone, waking my girlfriend up in all of the commotion. She groggily awoke, asking me what was wrong. I told her I would explain in a minute and call the police. I began speaking to the operator when the chanting began to start up again. I turned away for a brief moment to grab my bat when I noticed the chanting had stopped. I turned around to see my girlfriend peering outside the window, and she was completely motionless as I shouted at her to get away from the window. She turned back to me, her eyes wide, her face pale in fear. She wanted to scream but could not formulate a response. I walked over to her and pulled her towards me. She pushed me away slightly and motioned at me to look. The operator asked me to explain what was happening and to stay on the line, but I couldn't speak. I looked outside of the window at the men who were now perched on their knees. They were performing some kind of prayer or ritual. They were making strange hand gestures in an almost dance-like fashion. They were no longer in sync though, and were all creating different symbols with their hands. The men gradually got back to their feet and huddled in a circular formation. They broke apart and one of the men appeared from the center of the circle holding a large plain white box. He held it above his head before placing it gently in front of the cottage. They performed one final chant before turning around and slowly fading off into the distance. We were just sitting there, waiting for the police to arrive. I would leave, but I'm terrified they are still out there, and the cops should be here soon. I have no idea who these people are, and I have no idea how they found out where we live, and I have no idea what is in that box. I'm not sure I want to know either. We sat there in silence for what felt like an eternity. Every creak, every gust of wind unnerved us. I wanted to pack up and leave, but my girlfriend was against the idea. We waited a little while longer and eventually heard sirens in the distance, and I immediately breathed a sigh of relief. There was a knock on the door soon after. The relief I felt quickly turned to paranoia in my tired state, though. I was still afraid that these people could be anyone. They could be our neighbors down the street, or the very police officers asking us to answer the door. I peeked through the peephole and seen the police officers' sullen faces, and that somehow put me at ease. I worked up the courage to open the front door, and the two police officers introduced themselves as Officer Jenkins and Officer Henderson. I immediately began to blurt out some incoherent word vomit, I probably sounded insane, talking about a group of men chanting and praying outside of our house. They eventually managed to calm me down and I began to explain the situation in clear terms. They were perplexed by what I was saying and looked at me as if I were crazy. They entered the house and then saw my girlfriend on the bed, shaking nervously as well. Officer Jenkins directed me towards the living room while Officer Henderson calmly began to speak with my girlfriend. I sat there in silence for a little while before Henderson returned to the bedroom. He whispered something to Jenkins before he spoke to me and then he told me that my girlfriend had confirmed my story. I didn't like the way he sarcastically sounded out the word story when he said it either. 
It was as if he was mocking me. The two police officers sat at the dining room table and asked me to start from the beginning again. I explained absolutely everything to them in as much detail as I could. It was dark outside when we saw the men, however, so I did not have much of a description to give them. I could make out basic features, but not enough to give a vivid description. I couldn't even remember how many of them there were. I told the officers that the men had left a box outside, and Officer Henderson motioned to Officer Jenkins to go check it out. He re-entered the house a little while later, slightly out of breath and a little more frantic than he was before. Uh, you need to see this, he said in a cracked voice. Okay, I'll be right back. Stay inside, Officer Henderson said to me in an assertive manner. Officer Jenkins shot me a worried look as they exited the room. I sat there momentarily before curiosity got the better of me. I got up and told my girlfriend that I would be right back and headed outside. She had calmed down a little at this point and was on the phone with her mom. There was an unpleasant smell in the air as I exited the house and it got stronger and stronger and more gag inducing as I got closer to the box. The box itself was around three to four feet in length and quite shallow. The lid had been removed and the two officers were standing next to the police car in the driveway. Jenkins was pacing next to the car while Henderson was calling in for backup. I got my attention back towards the box and walked closer to look inside. I stumbled backwards initially as I thought there was a person inside of this box. But instead, inside of the box was what looked like a handmade doll of some kind. It had a head but no features on its face. It was crudely made with one long arm at the side and the head was coming apart from the neck. It was dressed in a white disheveled wedding dress and surrounded by dark decaying flowers that filled the remainder of the box. The dress itself had been slashed around the chest area, cutting through the stuffing of the doll, creating a large hole. The surrounding chest area of the dress was covered in what I can only assume was blood splatter. Carefully placed inside of the hole was a heart, and it was almost certainly an animal's heart, but it immediately made me gag. That was the awful smell. I jumped as I heard Henderson shout over to me. He frantically ushered me back inside of the house and told me to wait inside and lock the doors while they searched the area. He was much, much more serious this time. I locked the front door as he requested and sat next to my girlfriend in the bedroom. She asked me was everything okay and I told her that it was. I didn't mention the box and I didn't want to freak her out any more than she already was, but I knew this was going to be a huge problem. A couple more police cars then arrived shortly after that and we were told to remain in the house for the time being. We stayed inside for a little while before being asked if we had anywhere else we could stay for a few days. And I was more than happy to get out of that house for a little while to say the least. One of the police cars then escorted us to my parents house, which is a 15 minute drive away. We arrived at my parents house around 4 p.m. and had not slept for over 24 hours and were pretty much out of it when we arrived. After briefly explaining the events to my parents, we locked ourselves in one of the bedrooms and tried to get some sleep. I must have passed out shortly after because when I woke up, the sun was rising through the darkness. There was a soft knocking coming through the bedroom door and I was alarmed at first until I heard my father's voice. He told me that the police were here to ask a few questions and asked if I felt up to it. I gently closed the door to not wake my girlfriend and headed downstairs. The two police officers from before were standing at the foot of the stairs and asked to speak to me in private. We apologize for bothering you so early. We conducted a search of the area and we need to ask you some questions, Officer Henderson said. Okay, what is happening? I quickly rebutted. We need to show you some photographs. Can you identify anybody that looks familiar? He said. He opened a small plastic folder and removed an array of photos. They were all pictures of women. They looked like stock photos that were pulled off the internet. The photos were professional grade quality and the women were all dressed in either evening gowns or wedding dresses. I gulped as I scanned my eyes over the women's faces. All of their faces were contorted in a fearful gaze. They looked tired and beat up as they stared ahead. The majority of the women were hunched over and had bruising on the parts of their skin that could be seen. What is this, I said as I raised my head, disturbed at the images. He glanced at his partner for a moment before turning back to me. Well, we conducted a search of the area last night and in the early hours we searched the barn in the field behind your house. Inside of that barn there seemed to have been what I can only describe at the moment as 
some sort of religious activity. These photos were found there. We're attempting to identify the women in these photos at present before we move forward, he said. Religious activity? I asked. What do you mean? He once again glanced at his partner before taking a deep breath and exhaling. We cannot divulge any more information at this point. We will need you and your girlfriend to come down to the station to make an official statement when you feel up to it. And we will contact you if we need anything more, he said. We have police cars patrolling the area just in case. They got up to leave before Henderson turned back towards me again. I shouldn't be saying this to you, but we found pictures of you and your girlfriend dating back to last year. The photos were taken from a distance, and it seems that these people have been watching you for quite some time before making contact, he said. None of these photographs were hidden. They were all out in the open in the barn, so I assume that they didn't care if any of it was found. I strongly suggest you remain here for the time being and do not go back to the house, he stated. I nodded back to him as if it was the only response I could muster. I sat there in silence after they left, trying to wrap my head around this entire situation. If they had been watching us for months, why had they not made their move sooner? Why now? They would have had countless opportunities in the past where my girlfriend was completely alone in the house. She would also frequently go for lone early morning runs through the field. Were the women in the pictures once in similar situations? Were they alone? I also have no idea what this doll means. I have a million questions right now, but no answers. If anyone can enlighten me on any of this, I would appreciate any help I can get. We're going to stay at my parents for the time being, as it is a more residential area, and I need to take this in. In the coming days, I need to come up with a plan. Law enforcement has now moved us to an undisclosed secure location. We have been told not to disclose our location to anyone or make direct contact with anyone back home, and I haven't told them that I am writing up my accounts of what is happening either. They would never allow this. At this point, though, I feel this is beyond the comprehension of the local police, and I can't imagine they have dealt with anything like this before. Things started to calm down over the past few days, and it felt as if the storm may have settled. In that short time, though, it was as if everything had returned to some semblance of normalcy. I knew, though, in the back of my mind, that it wasn't over. These people weren't just going to go away. The only time we had left in the house was to write up an official report at the police station, and there had been no new developments in the case, as far as we were aware, and no sightings of any of these people. That was until yesterday evening when the sirens in the distance brought us back to reality. I hoped that they would pass us by, but as the sirens drew closer, I knew it was for us. I opened the front door to three police cars pulling up to the house. A police officer exited one of the cars and jogged up to the front door. Sir, we need you and your family to pack a bag immediately, he said. We need to leave as soon as possible. Uh, what's going on? Did something happen? I asked. Sir, I need you to pack a bag immediately and come with us, he said in a hurried tone. We all packed up a bag and headed off into the unknown. The sincerity in the police officer's tone had made me blindly follow his orders. I consistently asked questions on the way, but didn't receive many responses. We sat there in silence for most of the trip, and after an hour of driving, we arrived at a house. We entered the house and were greeted by two plainclothed police officers. We emotionlessly walked around the house as they gave us a brief tour. They then directed us to the living room and asked us to take a seat. We all sat down in the living room in silence until one of the officers spoke. There's been some new developments in this case. There will be an official report given soon and we need to remove you and your family as soon as possible as we believe there is a serious threat to your safety, he said before briefly pausing. I think he was expecting some kind of response but none of us spoke a word and then the officer continued. We received reports this evening concerning a group of people congregating outside of your house. Police officers were dispatched to the scene, but when they arrived, the people had already left. The front windows to the house had all been broken and the front door was off its hinges. The police officers entered the house at around 8 p.m. and searched the property. They entered the bedroom. He cleared his throat and wiped his brow before continuing. They entered the bedroom of the property and found a female tied to the bed. She was spread across the bed and pronounced dead on arrival. He cleared his throat once again and shot a worried look to his partner. His partner nodded to him and the officer continued. 
The woman had been mutilated and her blood was strewn across the wall to create a message. We had to move you immediately as we feel you are in imminent danger from these people. The message said, not right for him, you will be. There was also a number carved into the woman's chest. It was the number 21. Does this mean anything to any of you? He said. I thought about it, but couldn't come up with anything at all. I was completely stunned. 21 is not our age, nor is it either of our birthdays. I mentioned that it may be the amount of victims, but the officers did not seem to agree. We all sat there staring off into the distance before my girlfriend began to cry and sob uncontrollably. I attempted to console her with my mother, but it wasn't much use. That could have been her laid out across that bed and gutted like a pig, and it still could be. These people seem insistent, and we cannot hide forever. Seeing her in this state, my fear quickly turned to rage. I then started shouting at the police officers. What is the next course of action? What the hell are you supposed to do now? We can't just stay in hiding for the rest of our lives. Well, you're going to have to for the time being, he said. We will be posted inside the house and a police car will be outside. We will find these people, he said. The officer turned to face me. The police officers then exited the room on that note and gave us some time alone. We must have sat there for an hour in silence before we finally decided to head off to bed. The police being inside and outside of our house allowed us to regain some kind of feeling of security. They could not know where we were and that would be impossible. There's no way these people knew where we were. That would be completely impossible. They would surely not come to this house with the police here either. I waited for my girlfriend to pass out from exhaustion before I finally managed to fall asleep myself. I awoke several times throughout the night. It wasn't the cult that was haunting my dreams. It was that doll. The featureless face was more detailed with each passing nightmare. They all had the exact same theme and it was almost an out-of-body experience. I was watching myself and my girlfriend sleeping from the far wall. I was glued to the spot, unable to move. The doll was at the end of the bed with its back towards me in the first nightmare. I woke suddenly, but quickly passed out again soon after, brushing it off. The next time, it had slowly began to turn its head. I awoke in a panic and searched around the room and under the bed. I knew I was being crazy, but I couldn't help it. I felt like something was watching me and it sent a shiver down my spine. I finally fell asleep again a little while later. The next nightmare lasted a lot longer. It had turned its head and it was facing my direction. It had stitching where the eyes and mouth would be. The stitching was moving vigorously as if something was attempting to break the stitching away. It would be as if you had duct tape on your mouth and eyes and were desperately trying to remove it without access to your hands. This one unsettled me a little bit more than the others but once again I somehow managed to fall back asleep. I was so tired at this point that I couldn't keep my eyes open even if I wanted to. In the final nightmare, before I woke this morning, the doll had broken free from the stitching. It was looking directly at me and the stitching had been replaced with endless pools of darkness. I could sense the evil within the stair. I could feel the sweat dripping down my forehead. I looked down and a long arm at the side of the doll was gently caressing my girlfriend's leg as it looked towards me. It was all just a nightmare, but every time I close my eyes, I swear I can see it. I think I must just be exhausted from the whole situation. I have barely slept over the past week and I think everything is just getting to me now. We are prisoners in this house. We cannot leave or contact anyone on the outside. This is my only means of communication with the outside world. I do not feel safe. I think that these people will do anything in their power to make sure that she is theirs. I feel that they are just biding their time and there must be a reason why. I think that the number 21 must have something to do with all of this. We have been here for three days now. There have been no news reports or police statements. I have been vigorously checking online for any kind of update. The police officers have been deflecting all of my questions regarding the matter and I'm getting increasingly frustrated. They just keep reiterating to us that we are in the safest place possible. I sat down with my dad tonight with the intention of researching further into this ourselves. There is an estimated 275,000 people reported missing every year. Most of these are quickly found, but there are still a lot of people that remain missing. We were literally looking for a needle in a haystack. We searched the local area, and although there was a number of missing people reported, only one stood out. 
There was a woman a few years back that went missing from our area. She was in her mid-twenties and lived alone. There was an appeal online from her parents, and it was a rather lengthy post giving details on the case and asking for any further information. The post stated that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, she had reported that she had felt as if she was constantly being watched and stalked. It also stated that a week prior to her disappearance, her house had been broken into, but nothing had been taken. There was no mention of a call or anything similar, though. But the official report gave a different story. The woman had a history with drug abuse, and it was assumed that she had overdosed. There was a lake near her house, and it was speculated that she had fallen into the lake and drowned. Her body was never found. The parents strongly objected to this, stating that she had overcome her addiction years prior and would never have relapsed. They were adamant on this, and the appeal was still open even with the case closed. The thing that stood out the most, though, was the date. The woman was reported missing on the 20th of June, 2019. The report stated that she may have been missing slightly before this, as no one had spoke to her two days prior to the report being made. I appreciated the comments as it made things a lot easier. I had been feeling crabby recently and they certainly lightened the mood. We researched into the summer solstice which happens to be on the 21st of June. It varies from year to year but that is the date for it. It is an occult ritual that has been celebrated by a variety of groups. The pagans among others celebrate this date. It is when the sun is at the highest point that a human or animal will be sacrificed as an offering. I am not certain that this is what that number means, but it petrified me. It makes frighteningly logical sense at this point, but we looked a little into other suggestions. It could also be the amount of victims the cult has taken. I find this unlikely though. With the aggression they are showing us, it would seem that something would have been reported before. That is, unless they are becoming more desperate to complete their rituals. I should mention that there have been quite a few visitors since we have been here. I have not seen a uniformed officer in a few days and the officers that are watching us seem to change frequently. I guess that's normal, as everyone needs downtime at some point. I also cannot see the patrol car that is meant to be watching the house either. There are men outside though who are constantly watching the house. The officers seemed friendly for the most part, so I had not been too worried or inquisitive. I figured they had a job to do and we should leave them to it. It felt nice to have some semblance of safety and security, if even fleeting. A few hours ago, I awoke to commotion and shouting coming from downstairs. It was still dark outside. I glanced at my phone and saw that it was 11 p.m. I walked down the stairs and saw the two on-duty officers talking to a woman in the living room. The woman was an older woman with an air of authority about her. It felt as if she was chastising the officers. They were louder before, but must have heard the stairs creak as they were now speaking in hushed tones. I heard one of them whisper something about it not being the right time yet as I got closer. I knocked on the door even though it was open to announce my presence. The talking abruptly ceased and they all just sat there staring at one another. The two officers sat there like naughty children, not saying a word and looking at the woman for assurance. The woman then slowly lifted herself off of the chair and walked towards me with a wide grin stretched across her face. Oh, hello there. You must be Jason. I'm sorry, did we wake you up? She paused briefly before continuing. I am one of the detectives working on your case, she said. I just wanted to come over and check on you. It is nothing to worry about and there have been no new developments, she said while holding out her hand to greet me. There's still no news on anything, I said, stepping back slightly. Nope, not much of anything yet, I'm afraid. You should try and go back to sleep. We can all talk more in the morning, she said while grabbing my hand and directing me out of the room, her grin unwavering, the smile only mildly detracting from her sinister stare. I released my hand from the woman's grip and warily headed back upstairs. She looked at me inquisitively as if I had heard or seen something that I shouldn't have. I began to quicken my pace as I got upstairs and locked the door behind me as I entered the bedroom. Something felt off here. I suddenly felt a wave of fear rush over me and I sat there staring at the door for what felt like hours before I began to start writing this down. I expected someone to break through the door at any moment but nothing happened and then my phone began to ring. It was a number that I did not have saved in my phone and I didn't want to answer it so I let it ring out. 
a voicemail notification popped up on the screen soon after. I opened it up and immediately heard a familiar voice on the other end. Hi Jason, this is Officer Henderson. Sorry to call you so late. We have just been to your parents' house to check on you, but all the lights were off and there's no cars. I guess you've got away from the madness for a little while. I hope that all is okay. Can you call me back when you get this as we need you both to come down to the station to answer some more questions, the voicemail said. I staggered back, speechless. Why was he not aware that we had been moved into protective custody? I then heard loud noises coming from the outside. I moved towards the window and peered out of the curtains. The woman was now shouting at the men outside. She was pointing at the house furiously. I quickly ducked down as she turned to face her window, and I think she saw me. I slowly raised my head towards the window again and the woman and the two men were staring directly at me. She sighed to herself before they all began walking towards the house again. I ducked back down immediately and got out of view. Then I heard the front door slam shut. I woke my girlfriend and we moved everything we could move to block the door. I did not have time to explain but she immediately knew something was off. Then I grabbed my phone and called the number back, but the line was busy. I tried again and again until I finally got through. Hello, is this Officer Henderson? I said, barely able to form a sentence. Hello, Jason. Yeah, sorry about the late night call. I just, I got a little worried when no one was in. Is everything okay? He said. No, no, we, listen, we have been moved into protective custody. We've been here for three days, I said, my voice cracking with every word. We didn't arrange that. That makes no sense. Where are you? Who took you there? He said. I could hear the panic in his voice. Uh, we, I, I don't know where we are. There are people all around the house and I think they know, I said before he interrupted me. Keep your phone on. We will try to triangulate your location right now. We sat there in silence for another 20 minutes until a gentle tapping on the bedroom door could be heard. I attempted to scream at them to leave us alone, but it came out as more of a soft whimper. I still had the phone to my ear and could hear Officer Henderson shouting down the radio to hurry up. I can hear something. What is happening? The local police are only a few minutes away. You need to lock yourself in a secure room, he said. The banging on the door is becoming incessant now. The woman was calmly asking us to open the door, but now she is maniacally screaming, and I'm not listening to her. They have no reason to keep me alive. They only want my girlfriend alive, and I have to protect her. The fear has overcome us and we can do nothing but sit here motionless, staring at the door. I can only sit here in silence as I hear my mother's agonizing screams for help piercing through my ears. I can only sit here in silence as the sound of my father's bones cracking resonates through the house while he tearfully begs us not to open the door. I tried to stop them. I begged and pleaded through the door for my parents' safety but was met with contempt. The heinous sounds of laughing mixed with my parents' screams quickly overcame me. I began to remove the barricade from the door as rage and fear rushed through me. I had removed most of the barricade when I turned to my girlfriend. She had not spoken a word through all of this. She sat there, pale as a ghost, rocking back and forth. I stared at her, looking for any kind of guidance but received none. I attempted to plead for my parents' lives over and over again but I only received one response. They would make a trade, a like-for-like -like trade in a sense. They would allow my parents to live if I opened the door and handed my girlfriend over. I feel they could have broken down the door if they wanted to and I think they enjoyed me having to make a decision of this magnitude. I knew in my heart that if I opened the door, none of us was going to survive. There was far too many of them for me to stand any chance of getting out. I'm not a trained fighter and barely had any weapons at my disposal. I began to slowly place items back in front of the door as tears streamed down my cheeks. I was handing my parents a death sentence. The people who had raised me and always had me at the forefront of their mind, I now knew I was turning my back on them. I sat back down and covered my ears to block out the misery and pain. The sounds of my mother and father soon dissipated as silence engulfed the house. The monotonous, constant cackling was all I could hear over the buzzing in my ears. This woman was now mocking me, and she wanted me to open the door, and it took every single fiber of my being not to do so. After a little while, the sounds of the woman also disappeared. We were then left in complete silence, because sirens soon filled the silence 
and flashing lights lit up the house. The sound of the door being broken in was quickly followed by the police announcing themselves, then the sound of footsteps getting closer and closer. This is the police, one voice rang out. We need backup immediately. Get down. Get down on the ground right now. Do not fucking move, another voice said. I sat there motionless, unable to face what was on the other side of the door. The door handle soon began to jolt up and down as the police asked us to open the door. I moved over to the door unaware if it was just another ploy. It was at that point where it no longer mattered. I had lost all faith and I removed the barricade and opened it. I fell to my knees as soon as I gazed upon the carnage that was ensuing outside of the room. The police officer just stared at us after realizing we were the victims in all this. He attempted to usher me back inside of the room, but I wouldn't move. The police were in the process of arrests and detaining men as they awaited for backup to arrive. There were eight police officers that arrived at the scene with what I assumed was the entire cult sitting in a circle on the balcony. There was a noose hanging in the center of them but no one was attached to it. The police were screaming at the men to get down on the floor, but the men were not listening. At one point, one of the officers smashed one across the face with the butt of his shotgun. The moment I had exited the room, the men had all turned to face me in sync. They all had the same sinister smirk on their faces. They did not object or struggle when the police forced them to the ground, their stares remaining transfixed only on me, my dad who would have done absolutely anything to keep me safe and my best friend was laying motionless at the other side of the hallway. A police officer was desperately performing CPR to bring him back, but he remained there lifeless. I searched around the room for my mom, but she was nowhere to be seen. I snapped out of my trance and frantically began to run towards my dad. The police officer sorrowfully shook his head as I approached. I began pounding on his chest while sobbing uncontrollably attempting to bring him back of life. It was worthless. He had passed long before the police had gotten there. The police officer pulled me away to console me and I gained some composure in an attempt to find my mom, and then the anger took over. I walked over to the men whose glances had followed me across to the other side of the room, and I screamed at one of them as I hit him over and over again asking where my mom was. The police officers barely had control of the situation as it was, and I continued to hit the man over and over, but he remained in silence, smiling at me as blood ran down his face. The other men did not attempt to help him either, and he didn't bother to defend himself. I just kept smashing him repeatedly in his face, one blow after the next, and all of them continued to smile at me. One police officer finally pulled me away, but we both stumbled backwards and one of the men in the circle then grabbed me and pulled me in close, whispering into my ear. He spoke like a child in broken English. Mother could not take us all with her. It is for the best. Soon we will have another blessing, as will you. We all will have another brother soon. Mother is patient, but she never forgets, and she never forgives. She will get what she wants, he said. A police officer eventually pushed him back to the floor, pushing me away as he did. I fell backwards onto the wall and then I began to cry uncontrollably, begging and pleading for them to tell me where my mom had been taken. The rest of the police force soon arrived. Amongst them was Officer Henderson. They removed the men from the upstairs and brought them down into the police vans as I sat next to my dad, aimlessly stroking his hair, begging for him to return to me. We were escorted out of there soon after, as the police searched the remainder of the house and grounds. Officer Henderson was silent as he drove us over to my girlfriend's parents' house. I think he took some of the blame in all of this. The police constantly monitored the premises while we remained there. We did not stay there for more than a few days as we did not want to put anybody else in danger. We were given new identities and moved to a completely different part of the country. We have removed ourselves from social media and made sure to never broadcast our location to anyone. The men that were arrested at that house were relatively young men. They had no identities and absolutely no records. To the regular world, they were ghosts. The men that were posing as police officers inside of the house and the officers that originally took us to the house have not been caught. The woman, who I now assume is behind a lot of this, has also not been caught. Officer Henderson did not mention much else about the case to us. 
He gives us updates periodically, but has definitely held certain details back. I think he feels that we are as safe as we're going to be. My mother has never been found, and I'm not sure that she ever will be. The only thing that he did tell me was that of the men that were caught were of varying ages and had the intelligence of young children. They have not stopped crying for their mother, even to this day. They have not been able to answer any questions, and he is not sure if they even know what they have done. He assumes that the mother was the woman that visited us on the final night. He also believes that this cult is not just local. He doesn't know how far the stretch is and that things will never be the same. We fear living in this house or contacting friends and relatives. I'm not sure if we ever will feel safe again. No one can protect us forever, that much I know. I blame myself completely for the death of my father. If we had never involved him, if we had just gone somewhere else, if we made different decisions, maybe he would still be alive too. I believe my mom might still be alive. I believe she might be alive until she's no longer needed. It's just too bizarre how she disappeared from the house. I hope that one day she will be found alive and well. But as the days and weeks pass by, it seems more and more unlikely that that's going to happen. There is a small part of me that hopes that she was sacrificed. It's better than the alternative. I can't fathom the strength that it would take her to survive for nine months with these people. I know that they will find us again. I know that we can't run forever. They may already be aware of our location for all I know. I have no idea how many people are involved in this cult either, and I have no idea how much longer we can run and hide. I just want it all to end. I do know, however, that we are not the only ones at risk. We are not special. And so if you hear me, please listen and take my suggestion that if you feel you are being watched, if you see anyone out of the ordinary, if you receive anything out of the ordinary, or if you come in contact with these people, do not brush it off. Do not stay in one place. Do not trust anyone. This cult is extremely dangerous. Once they latch on to you, they will never give in. And I pray that none of you are their next victims. Because this is certainly one of the most unknown, uncanny, and murderous anonymous cults that exists in the world today.